Hey, 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 happy Monday. Come on in, pull up a chair. The Gaming Gang Dispatch is in the air. gang and welcome once again to the duct tape studios i'm jeff mcalear your host here at the gaming gang dispatch brought to you by incredibly enough the gaminggang.com which i happen to be the founder and editor in chief so welcome aboard tonight is monday march 27th 2023 this is live stream Nine hundred and one. If you're not overly familiar with the show, let me point out, super, super casual around here, just hanging out, talking about the latest in tabletop gaming news. And normally we will take a first look at a game, which is what we'll be doing tonight. In fact, it is a horror week here on the Dispatch. We're going to be looking at some spooky tabletop role-playing games and we are going to kick off with a look at the brand new rivers of london role-playing game from our friends over at chaosium inc of course this is a system based on uh ben i want to say his last name is aronovich his rivers of london series of or they're kind of like urban fantasy slash horror novels. So we are going to be jumping on in and checking this out tonight. Yes. So also do want to point out, if you're not overly familiar with how this show works, we do tackle the tabletop gaming news first. So if you are tuning in to check out Rivers of London, keep in mind it's probably going to be about 35, maybe 40 minutes before we get into that page through. So if you're watching live, just kick back, put your feet up, relax. Maybe you've had a long, hard Monday already. Join the gang, hang out. Of course, if you happen to watch this stream 30 minutes or more after it ends, there will be timestamps. So if you are impatient and you just gotta get to that first look, you'll be able to. So those timestamps are located in the show notes and depending on what device you happen to be watching this on, it might actually be right there in the timeline in front of you. Of course, when you're not watching videos on the Gaming Gang channel, be sure to visit thegaminggang.com for all latest in tabletop gaming news, reviews, and a whole lot more that you won't find here on the YouTube channel. You know the drill. Get your geek on at thegaminggang.com. Lastly, there is chat available. This is a live stream. It is not on screen. It's one of the ways I keep some of the more unusual commenters at bay. And you must be a subscriber to the channel for at least 48 hours before you can take part in chat. Yet another way that I keep some of the more unusual commenters at bay. But if you want to say howdy, maybe you've got a question, a comment, Maybe there'll be something you want a closer look at in Rivers of London. Chime in. I'll do my best to respond. First out the gate tonight is one of our chat moderators. Yes, Sarah D is with us. So is Kevin R. Smith. Flaming here on another of our chat moderators. This one from Australia is hanging out, as is veteran Griblocks. Kathy Evans and Zorak Zoran won. So it is double Z1. Double Z1 is saying that they are so very drunk today, they'll just say hello. <laughs> but they really do want to see Rivers of London. Hey, that's fine. That's okay. 
So not a problemo. So uh, Sarah D is uh, not lurking, as Kevin points out. She uh, points out that now sometimes she likes to mix it up a little bit. Keep everybody on her toes. All right. Or I should say keep everybody on their toes. Probably sounded like I said keep everybody on her toes. That would not be comfortable. That would not be comfortable. All righty. I will talk about my experience a little bit at after the news. But first, let's jump on in and tackle today's tabletop gaming news. Because hitting stores this summer from Ravensburger is the eagerly, eagerly, eagerly anticipated Disney Larkana trading card game. Here's what I know. Wield magic inks and the power of Lorcana as you assemble your team of Disney characters. The official Disney trading card game, Disney Lorcana, is going to be available August 18th. As an illuminator, you'll wield six magical inks to summon glimmers of Disney characters. Glimmers can appear as familiar friends or in fantastically reimagined forms. Recruit glimmers to your team as you travel through the world of Lorcana. To play Disney Lorcana, each player will need to have a deck of 60 cards. Ready to play starter decks contain a pre-constructed deck with a specific card list. If you're new to trading card games, or if you want to experience the game with a deck designed and tested by Team Lorcana, this is going to be a good place to start. These starter decks are going to carry an MSRP of $16.99. I believe there are going to be six to start off. This is this is actually this first wave is called the first chapter. You can also expand your collection with booster packs. Unlike starter decks, booster packs contain 12 random cards from Disney Lorcana, the first chapter. You can use those booster packs to build and customize your decks with abilities and characters beyond those found in starter decks. These boosters will carry an MSRP of $5.99. Then you can also jump in with the gift set. The gift set includes two collectible oversized foil cards and two playable foil game cards, in addition to game tokens and four boosters. The gift set for Disney Lorcana, the first chapter, will feature Mulan and the Imperial Soldier and Hades and the King of Olympus. This will carry an MSRP of $49.99. There will also be is that uh, I believe there's going to be, I think it's going to be called a player's collection. And it will contain, I think it's eight boosters and a strategy guide and tokens and things like that. So... That will also carry an MSRP of $49.99. Once again, do you understand that this is going to be arriving August 18th? There are a lot of people excited for it. Does seem like it's kind of vibing a little on the Magic the Gathering because you've got the six different inks. Yeah, okay. <laughs> different manas. All righty, I'm getting it. But of course, I have to point out, I guarantee my best friend, Elliot Miller, will pick up at least, oh, I'll take a stab, $100 <laughs> worth of this to check it out. But hey, you know, it could be pretty cool. Could be pretty good. Then again, could be another, you know, I don't know, stab at doing a collectible card game with Disney that just doesn't get it done. Got to point out, Ravensburger is not exactly known for collectible card games, but they are known for games, so that does help. So Chris Phillips is with us in chat. So Kevin points out big news about Chaosium past few days has been the basic role playing coming out under the orc. Yes, we can uh, we can talk a little bit about that when we start taking a peek at Rivers of London in just a little bit. On to the next news piece. The first expansion for the 
Hulkshi board game. H and Hachette. Oh, that! Ah, I forgot. I zoned out. I have a preview video for Lurkana, which you won't really find anything new about. But it will show some cards. So let's take a peek. So I see Kevin mentions that uh, they thought Lord Kana wasn't going to really be that big, but the way that uh, Wizards of the Coast has been screwing up magic, who knows? Well, as far as the distributors are concerned, I will tell you that they are indicating to retailers that there will be allotments that retailers are not going to be able to get as much of this product as they want. So I think this is going to, it's probably going to at least sell as uh, somebody, oh, just uh, as Kevin points out, it's going to make money as a collectible, even if you pl people play it, right? Because it's Disney. It's usually how that works. Coco B is with us in chat. So thank you very much for hanging out. Uh, Coco is washing their car as the second winter has started. Oh yes, I got to enjoy some of that second winter on Saturday up in Lake Geneva, Wisconsin. <laughs> so Chris says, after seeing how much of a wallet drain the Disney mobile game Sources Arena was, I'm sure this will be a money drain as well. So from what I understand, kind of a uh, rumor mill. So I, I can't say this is officially from like Ravensburger, but supposedly Lurkana is not going to fall into the same trap as some other trading card games. So like, uh, I guess, I, I guess Pokemon tends to release a bunch of special cards that are available at, you know, specific events only. They're not going to do that. They're not going to have special card releases, say for like Gen Con, where you can only get them at Gen Con. So they're gonna try to make this, I guess, as kind of even footed for everyone who wants to get into the game. But as, as I mentioned previously, the distributors out there are really pointing out that there will be allocations that real t retailers are not going to get as much product as they want. Anyway, moving right along as I started to originally, the first expansion for the whole tree board game is arriving from Studio H and Hachette Games. Here's the deets on Undead and Alive. Ever since the Titans created the world, death has never been as final as could have been hoped. Sure, there's not much of a chance you'll find Grandma clawing her way out of the family tomb on her own, but a lot of strange things have happened. During the new chronicles and incidents in this first expansion to Holtre, rangers may fall prey to languor, a type of supernatural evil. It is a morbid state of melancholy that grips their heart and soul. This first expansion contains three new chronicles, one short, and two long, 36 cards in total, confronting you with the shadow forces of the undead. Six new assignments with a terrifying new incident pack called Death Abounds, and the new Langer 
mechanic offering a thematic challenge. Of course, a copy of Whole Tray is required to play. Whole Tray Undead and Alive is for one to four players, ages 10 and up. Plays in 60 to 120 minutes. This expansion is going to carry an MSRP of $19.99 when it arrives in Q2. I have heard some good things about this game. So I really don't know much about it, but it uh, it seems to have kind of a, uh, a fairy tale, kind of like fantasy story kind of vibe to it. I believe that's how the proceedings go. You have adventures and the adventures are made up of cards that you have to address. So Kevin points out with uh, Lorcana, so no magic style secret layers, that would be nice. That is my understanding. Supposedly Lorcana is gonna have four releases a year though. So that's quite a bit. <laughs> One each quarter, I guess. Roger Prudhomme is with us in chat. Welcome aboard. Good to see you, Roger. So let's talk about some role-playing game news because Cubicle 7 Entertainment has released the digital edition of the eagerly anticipated Warhammer 40K roleplay Imperium Maledictum. Here's the latest. Imperial Maledictum is a new Warhammer 40,000 role-playing game set in the glorious Macharian Sector, a sector forged in blood and fire from the thousand worlds conquered by Lord Solar Macarius. It is a sector rife with peril and treachery. Imperium Maledictum uses a familiar but refined D100 system to drop players into tales of intrigue, betrayal, and conspiracy. Players take on the role of Imperial Adepts and citizens recruited by a powerful patron. These influential figures use teams outside the usual chain of command to undertake grim and perilous missions, furthering their often inscrutable interests. To succeed, players must weave their way through the complicated web of competing factions that make up the Imperium. They must navigate a realm where a whispered accusation can be as deadly as any bolter, plumbing the depths of the most lethal hives and navigating the often far more insidious threats that grace the courts of the Highborn. Do you have what it takes to survive the grim and treacherous adventures in the 41st millennium? You can pre-order the 352-page hardcover, which includes the PDF, for an MSRP of $59.99. It is not expected to arrive until Q4. Or you can grab just the PDF alone right now. That's right. It is out right now over at Drive Thru RPG for $29.99. And my friends over at Cubicle 7 Entertainment sent along a copy of the PDF to me. So I will be taking a peek inside. I got to be honest. I don't know about the mechanics of this game, but I really, really do have a feeling that it is sort of a revamped Warhammer uh, fantasy role play kind of system. And the reason why it kind of gives me that impression is it says it's a D100 system, which we, of course, know Warhammer fantasy role play is, but it also says that the players undertake grim and perilous missions, which we do know grim and perilous is a phrase used with Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay. So I, I think they're kind of hinting at that. David B is popping on into chat. Thanks for hanging with us tonight. So let's move on to the next news piece. Now available is the Cobalt Guide to Dragons. Here's the scoop from Cobalt Press. Dungeons are half the game. You can't control what players are going to do. That's half the fun. But you can control where they do it. That's a whole other half. 
The Cobalt Guide to Dungeons gives both new and experienced game masters over 100 pages of insight and ideas into making dungeons great. In-depth essays from industry luminaries teach you how to think outside your own boxes and into a larger realm of challenge, discovery, and good old monster bashing. Practical essays give you insider tips and tricks to design non-linear dungeons to explore, to think in three dimensions to make amazing spaces, and to make every room count, even when there's no monster. You can create solutions in addition to simply combat and dole out treasure without blowing the bank. The Cobalt Guide to Dungeons features essays from classic voices of the RPG canon, such as David Zeb Cook, Frank Mentzker, and Lawrence Schick. It also includes newer voices, including Dominique Dickey, Sadie Lowry, and Aaron Roberts. Open this book and level up your half of the game. The Cobalt Guide to Dungeons softcover carries an MSRP of $19.99. Or you can grab just the PDF alone over at DriveThruRPG for $12.99. And fine folks over at Cobalt Press sent me the soft cover, and I started uh, reading it. I'm about 30 pages into it. Pretty interesting. I will point out some of the essays aren't probably aimed towards the way I like to run games or I like to to create set pieces and things like that but there is a slew of different opinions in this book so it's not just one sort of theme that everybody's trying to drive home with their essays no not at all so once again Cobalt Guide to Dungeons is available right now for $19.99 or grab just the PDF for $12.99. Chuck Terrell is swinging on in. Thanks for coming on by to hang with the gang. My final news piece now available in PDF is the second edition of the Fantasy Age role-playing game. Here's the skinny from Green Ronin Publishing. Leap into sword and sorcery role-playing game adventures with the Fantasy Age core rulebook. Powered by the popular adventure game engine, Fantasy Age 2nd Edition is easy to learn, fun to play, and welcoming to new role players. The Fantasy Age core rulebook includes these features. Simple character creation. Pick an ancestry, such as Drac, Dwarf, Goblin, and Wild Folk. Pick a class, Envoy, Mage, Rogue, or Warrior. Pick a specialization, such as Duelist, Diplomat, pirate and sword mage and jump into the action heroic stunts the heart of the game is the stunt system which brings dynamism and uh, drama to the table roll doubles on 3d6 to pull off unexpected moves in combat cast more potent spells perform amazing feats of physical and mental prowess or even cut a rival down to size with a few clever words there's Mighty Magic. Spellcasters learn Arcana, which are themed groups of spells. Mixing and matching the 19 Arcana gives the Mage class a huge amount of flexibility. To get started, choose two Arcana like Beast, Cold, Death, Earth, Fate, Fire, Healing, Protection, Mind, and Shadow. There's Game Master Guidance. If you're new to role-playing games or have never GM'd before, the core rulebook breaks it all down for you. Not just GM advice, but practicalities as well. There's guidance for each of the GM's four roles. Game planner, game host, game runner, and game moderator. Also, customizable rules. The GM can use optional rules for the campaign to better reflect the setting. Choices include the twin systems of peril and daring, which allow for dramatic swings from disadvantage to advantage as attention builds. Horror rules can give the campaign a sinister turn. The fortune system is an alternate way to handle health and damage, first introduced in the Expanse role-playing game. The core rulebook includes a campaign setting of its own called Stranger Shores, Brave the Deeps, 
which has been the doom of many a ship, sail with a mystic navigator to travel to distant lands. Enter the stranger shores with Breakwater Bay, a starting adventure area to kick off your campaign. The book includes set sails for Breakwater Bay, a complete adventure. And there's so much more. You'll also find character talents, challenging monsters, chase rules, magic items, relationships and bonds, and more. This is the complete package. And this is part of the family. Green Ronin publishes other RPGs powered by the Adventure Game Engine. The Expanse, Modern Age, Blue Rose, Cthulhu Awakens, and Fifth Season. If you've played any age games, you already know the core of the system. Veteran gamers will be pleased to hear that Fantasy Age Second Edition is largely compatible with all previous Fantasy Age releases. Swords, sorcery, stunts, and stranger shores. The Fantasy Age core rulebook is your portal to exciting new role-playing game adventures. You can pre-order the 288-page hardcover of the second edition of Fantasy Age for $49 or, and I should say, 99 cents. Or grab the PDF right now at DriveThruRPG for $27 and 95 cents. ka -ching! It's cool. Good to see that Green Ronin's releasing a new edition of Fantasy Age. In fact, off the top of my head, I seem to recall that it was very recently that they just had a bundle offer with a bunch of the first edition fantasy age goodies out there so pretty sweet i'll have to uh i'll have to reach out one of these days i tried to touch base with green Ron and uh, i don't know maybe six seven years ago couldn't really get get on the same page as far as reviewing some stuff now they've got a new edition of what is probably their key role-playing game maybe they'd like to uh, get some coverage out there. Chris points out they like Frog God games and Nord games. Uh, both have some good 5e stuff too. Yes, and of course, uh, Frog God games also has Swords and Wizardry. So Chris points out Cobalt Press has good stuff, probably the best third-party 5e content out there. I'm pretty similar to to that uh, kind of uh, thought process as well. I really do like Cobalt Press quite a lot. Uh, for the most part, I usually enjoy their releases. Kabuki Kid is with us. Good to see double K's in the house. All right, so that is it for the Tabletop Gaming News tonight. Of course, I was just talking about drive through RPG. Don't forget... The Gaming Gang, thus the Dispatch, is affiliated with the One Bookshelf sites. So if you are going to visit, say, Drive Through RPG, please stop by thegaminggang.com first. Use one of our banner ads, and that way, if you do happen to make a purchase over at Drive Through RPG, I get a small portion at sale. All those nickels, dimes, and quarters really do add up and help keep thegaminggang.com around. Also, if you like this video, if you dig the channel, if you find thegaminggang.com to be a valuable resource, hell, if you just like what we do, by all means, please swing on over to paypal.me slash thegaminggang and making a small donation. And thankfully, big tip of the cap to all of you out there who use those banner ads over on the gaminggang.com and or visit paypal.me slash the gaming gang. Thank you very, very much. So sweet. Um, so Kevin points out Frog God Games is actually switching over to old school essentials. So they don't have any swords and wizardry anymore since Matt Finch left and took it to Mythmere Games. Yeah, I didn't realize Matt left because I interviewed him 
You know, it's funny. I was actually talking to Ellie about this uh, while we were hanging out at GaryCon. I said, it's funny. I'll sit there and be like, yeah, yeah, I, I remember I, I reviewed that like two, three years ago. And then I'll look and be like, oh, that was six years ago. Or eight years ago. <laughs> so I know I interviewed Matt Finch. That's eh, probably three, maybe four years ago. So, uh, yeah, so he, he took it off to Myth Mirror Games, eh? Cool deal. Tessie Trekkie is hanging with us tonight. So, welcome. Uh, they point out, note to self, stop buying RPGs, I'll never run. Hey, at least these days you can buy PDFs. So, and you can get big bundles as well. So, you know... Back in the early days, it was, you had to buy it. <laughs> or maybe, maybe you would be lucky to uh, to have a game store that had, you know, discounted games that they couldn't get rid of, <laughs> which not a lot of them did. So, uh, Chris says, seems like Fraud God Games is pitching for their... Swords and Wizardry stuff as Castles and Crusades friendly going forward. Huh. Kind of cool. I'll have to take a look into that. So, Double Z One says, now I saw that Jeff doesn't have his Green Bay Packers cap. I do not own a Green Bay Packers cap. Nope. Sorry, I'm a Bears fan, man. Why the hell would I ever do that? <laughs> <laughs> Anywho, so uh, went and checked out Gary Khan last week. In fact, that's why you didn't have any shows Tuesday or Wednesday. Uh, and I got to say, I had, I had a good time. I had fun. I don't know if I would do it again, to be very, very honest with you. And a big thank you to everybody who came up while I was there saying hi and uh, telling me how much they enjoy the show and watch the videos and the website and things like that. I, I was surprised by how many people actually came up to say hello to me. I was like, holy cow. You know, I'm used to going to a convention having, you know, like a couple people. Like, you know, like Gen Con, I might have three people over the course of Gen Con who come up and uh, recognize me. But uh, yeah, I was, I was like, holy cow. But, and actually, to be honest, through no fault of Gary Con, would I not necessarily return. Um, and I think the, really the main reason was that like Ellie and I had a really good time. Ellie and I spent a lot of time just like hanging out. So we were sitting in, we would, yeah, there were a few times we had an opportunity to, to get an open table to play some games because we had brought stuff with. But uh, all in all, we didn't play in very many uh, events. So I played in a Castles and Crusades introductory game on Thursday morning. I had fun. I had, I had a good time. Uh, in fact, stay tuned for more uh, Troll Lord Games coverage in the future. I believe we will be taking a look at uh, some more of their products in the near future. Uh, so then I had that, and then we... Um, we didn't have anything scheduled again until I think it was, I think it was nine o'clock. It was either nine or 10 o'clock and it was like a four hour block and it was going to be a uh, fight in the skies. So it was old Dawn Patrol and Elliot got there at 430. So we went, uh, got him all settled in and then we went out to eat and then we popped over to the convention and then we were doing something so that 
we didn't get to the spot where the event was taking place until like three minutes after nine. Now, remember, it was scheduled at nine. And there wasn't anywhere to sit. And it was like, nobody, you know, the, the guy who was like, gonna you're like running it or whatever was already in the middle of explaining all this stuff and it was kind of like really i mean this is a convention game you're not giving people a, a couple of minutes to get to the table if they're running late from something else so it's kind of like all right whatever so we went and we went back to the room and played uh, a couple of games and then the next day we played uh, we play tested an adventure that's coming for Mutant Crawl Classics from Goodman Games. Uh, actually, it's an it's a, an independent uh, designer that Goodman Games, you know, sells their adventures and that. And uh, we had fun with that. That was pretty cool. And then again, we really didn't have anything planned until later on. And then that got canceled. And so then it was like, oh, okay. So then on Saturday, we got all this snow. We had gotten six inches of snow up in Lake Geneva overnight. <laughs> it, it was like, uh, okay. It's like, so then uh, the way the resort was laid out, the parking for guests who were not staying at the hotel or at the resort, I should say, is like way off and it's like down a hill. So it was for one, it was kind of a pain in the ass. And then when we went Saturday morning, we ended up the, the closer guest parking was already full. And here it was like eight 40 in the morning. <laughs> it was already filled and there was further parking further down the hill that no joke if we had been walking and it had been just a regular day the walk to the resort would have been 15 minutes now think this it's all ice it's all snow and we got this and so we were like you know what screw it let's let's go play some games and uh, we'll come back later and hopefully at that point people have left you know stuff like that so anyway so then we're playing uh the new star wars deck building game because elliot picked it up not bad it was all right it was better than i was expecting it to be although it had that that typical fantasy flight games uh verbose but obtuse rules <laughs> sorry I tend to see FFG's rules all the time. Very verbose and also very obtuse. So anyway, so we're playing that, and then we get a message saying that our Saturday night game is canceled. And it was like, what the? So, and the thing is, with the we didn't have press badges. They don't offer press badges for Gary Khan. Uh, you had to, we had to buy our passes, so <clears throat> we were silver. So we we had silver badges, which was like the lowest. It was just your regular badge, because they had like gold and platinum. So when you were signing up for events, even though they didn't charge you for the events, like Gen Con's like two dollars ticket, um, a lot of events were already filled up by the time silver badge holders were able to book events. So we did have some, uh, we had some time frames where there just wasn't anything open. That's why we didn't have anything to play, right? So $107 for what eventually turned out to be Three things I played in. Elliot played in two because the Castles and Crusades adventure, he wasn't in Lake Geneva yet. So, like I said, had a good time. I thought it was really well done. 
Uh, I There were some things I especially liked where they actually had uh, snack carts that went around. Uh, you could order food at the game table and they would deliver it. Uh, it was not real expensive as far as the food. It was it was decent. It was better than uh, what you would normally get at, say, like a concession stand at a convention and cheaper. But the reality was a uh, lot of money. Blew a lot of money. We blew about as much as we normally would spend going to either Gen Con or San Diego Comic Con and got really, and there was nothing, you know, nothing for it. Yeah, you know, we go to Comic Con, we get press stuff, we get press swag, we get to go do stuff that, you know, regular attendees don't have an opportunity to do. Go to Gen Con and get review copies from different companies that, uh, that know me and things like that. This was, Nothing. I mean, I got a couple of modules from the guy who uh, we played the playtest for the MCC adventure. He was, and he was like, oh, you're, you're media? I said, yeah, we're, we're press. And he's like, oh, hey, I got a couple of these here. Do you mind taking a peek at them? I'm like, no, that's cool. And uh, made a few, you know, things we pointed out to the playtest that he was going to use that he's like, oh, wow, I didn't didn't even think of that we were like oh that's kind of cool but for the you know the the whole overall experience it was a lot of money for us to basically hang out and play our own games <laughs> kabuki kid asks did i buy any cool stuff no because the exhibit area wasn't anything that I was really interested in outside of buying a hat. Because I usually try to get a hat from a from a con that I go to. And then uh, you had to buy the program. So I had purchased the program, so I got that. And uh, that was about it. Because it was... Uh, Goodman Games was there, and uh, Troll Lord Games were there. And that was about the extent of, like, good-sized publishers. So just like there was supposed to be this new adventure that was coming out for uh, for D&D, &D, and it was, like, being released there, and that I didn't see anything. Uh, Kabuki Kid asked, did I meet any of the celebs? Uh, I did get to say hello to a few people. Uh, I got to say hi to Vince Vaughn, talk to him for a couple of minutes. Uh, and um, Joe, man, jam, 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 jam. And then I did talk to some folks uh, like uh, Jim Wampner, who is the author of Mutant Crawl Classics, who started Spellburn for Dungeon Crawl Classics. And I think they he still does was it Save or Die, that podcast? So we were chatting a little bit, but um, yeah, I mean, I didn't really get to talk. I, I said hello to Luke Gygax. That was, that was kind of about it. So Double Z1 asks, how many people are at an event like this? Uh, I believe they cut it off at 1,000. So Kevin says they think they've heard from other places that parking is an issue at GaryCon. I guess it's to be expected when it's in Lake Geneva, as opposed to a big city. Uh, well, it's not, a, it wasn't necessarily the problem of parking. It was the problem of the guest parking not being close. So uh, it was kind of funny because just to come out of the guest parking to get up into where the parking was for the, uh, you know, the guests and the, the, like the resort guests, you had to go up a hill. <laughs> so. <laughs> anyway. So Chris says, Vince Vaughn, huh? Did they have a dodgeball game going? No. So Liquid Nebula is hanging with us, says it's a fairly small con for how famous it is in the community. I'll tell you right now, there were a, a lot of people were having a good time. Don't get me wrong. I enjoyed it. I just 
like I said to Elliot, I said, you know what? If we got press passes that we didn't, you know, have to pay for badges to this, then it would be fine. You know, if we only got an opportunity to play in, you know, two or three events, okay, whatever. We didn't, we didn't pay for the passes. Situation like this, where we only got to play, I only got to play in three, he only got to play in two, that was a hundred bucks plus tax or fees or whatever it was. It came out to 107 something. To me, uh, I got better things to be <laughs> spending that. Anyway, but, you know, once again, you got to keep in mind, there were a lot of people at GaryCon, because I talk to people all the time. I tend to talk to people when I'm in line. You know, I just, I don't know. People just come up to me and start talking to me, too. But um, I didn't talk to anybody there who wasn't, you know, a, a affiliated with a publisher or something who went to Gen Con or Origins that Gary Khan was kind of like the convention they go to every year. And in fact, I had a few people tell me that, wow, you know, it was getting too big. Gary Khan was just getting way too big. I'm thinking, as Kevin points out, says Wikipedia lists 2,200 as far as attendance. Um, I just kept thinking to myself, if you think this is big, you should, you should go out to uh, San Diego for Comic-Con. You should be like, yeah. <laughs> all righty then so as i already pointed out tonight i am going to be diving on in to take a first look at rivers of london from chaosium inc but first i think it's time for a brief introduction intermission see i'm reading i'm trying to read chat and talk at the same time it's time for a brief intermission Here's the way we quench our thirst, quench our thirst, quench our thirst. Here's the way we quench our thirst. At the refreshment counter, now's the time to yum, yum, yum. Yum, 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 yum. Now's the time to yum, yum, yum. At the refreshment counter, popcorn, drinks, and candy too. Candy too, candy too. Popcorn, drinks, and candy too. At the refreshment counter, at the refreshment counter, at the refreshment counter. Why do people like you like Big D best? Because Drury's beer means more fun in a glass. Yes, more fun in a glass. Drury's brews flavor in, sweetness out, so you can enjoy glass after glass with no full feeling after. That means more fun. Yes, more and more, people like you like Big D best. Drury's beer, a perfect balance between flavor and lightness. Drury's beer, more flavor, less filling, more fun. That's why people like you like Big D best. How about joining them right now? Watch out where you throw those knives. Are you drinking well consistent coffee yet? No. Okay, let's try it blindfolded. He's here. My mystery day. Mystery day. The thrilling new Milton Bradley game of romance and mystery that's just for you. And you. And you. And you. Mystery date. Will you be ready for swimming? Or a dance? When you open the door, will your mystery date be a dream? Or a dud? Oh! Fun and surprises. That's mystery date. Remember, Milton Bradley makes the best games in the world. 
So girls, open the door for your mystery date. Get mystery date. Thank God the mystery date is there. I've seen that a few times at uh, the Gen Con auction. So they'll have like classic games and that. I've, I've seen it go up on auction a few times. Never had anything like that. Never knew any girls who had that either. So <laughs> yeah, yeah, I don't know. Certainly not a game that would fly now. Certainly not. All righty. I do want to mention that uh, I visited the Dungeon Hobby Shop Museum in Lake Geneva. So I will talk about that tomorrow. So uh, Kabuki Kid says they think it was the first Gary Con, or maybe it was the second. They asked Double K to scan their mono module covers since they had such nice copies to make into big banners they hung on the wall. I'll tell you what, I did see a big sign with um, Keep on the Borderlands. So I wonder if that was that was it. So, Misery Dates makes me think of Ren and Stimpy. Yikes. Mr. Marmello has joined us. Welcome aboard. I think we got a pretty good uh, chat rocking and rolling tonight. Okay, so as I mentioned, we're going to dive on in and take a first look at the Rivers of London role-playing game from Chaosium Inc. This 400-page hardcover with PDF will carry an MSRP of $59.99. I got to be honest, I'm not positive if this is available just yet or not. Because I have seen some distributors indicating that this won't be in stores until, like, first week of April. So, I don't know. But, let's carry an MSRP of $59.99. You can grab just the PDF alone right now. Over at Drive Through RPG for $29.99. Joseph Qualm is with us. And they were enjoying another great intermission. So Flaming Heron's pointing out, hey, appreciate it. If everybody watching could give the video a like. Yes, I will be the first to point out that uh, sometimes I'm kind of surprised by the number of viewers and people watching live, hanging out in chat, doesn't equate <laughs> to the number of thumbs up. It's like, ah, somebody was hanging out in chat, didn't, uh, didn't thumb up the video. Or maybe gave it a thumbs down. I don't know. All right, let's swing it over to the other camera because here I've got the Rivers of London. Let's get the shrink wrap off of this. So when I was talking about this last week, I had mentioned that I am not overly familiar with the setting for Rivers of London, the role-playing game. Uh, outside of that it is based on the novels of Ben, I, I guess I was right, it is Aronovich. And uh, I, I tried checking out an audio book of the first book, and I think it was just the narrator I just couldn't really get into. But I do understand that it is a very, very popular uh, urban fantasy slash horror uh, series of books. And uh, Titan Comics also has uh, a lot of uh, comic series that they'll release. So uh, they, they do like six issue arcs that are written by the author or the author does contribute to. I do understand that uh, Mr. Aronovich was very involved in the creation of this. So Kevin says, if you like the video while it's streaming, it can potentially draw more people into the audience. Not sure if the numbers TGG gets is enough, but it's worth a try. So, cool. So, uh, Double Z1 says, this is why I love this channel. 
Not one browses one in a PDF. So let's take a look at the back here. I think becoming a wizard is about discovering what's real and what isn't. Magic has returned to our world. In London, Officers of the Folly, the Metropolitan Police Service's special magic branch, take to the streets to solve cases, catch criminals, and come to grips with the Demionde, those who have been irreversibly changed by magic. Rivers of London, the role-playing game, is based on the hugely successful series of novels by Ben Aronovich. You play newly recruited members of the Folly, and together you solve mysteries and explore Newtonian magic against the backdrop of a vibrant and exciting modern London. Includes setting information and history, including details of how Newtonian magic works in Rivers of London, plus spells derived from those in the novels. All the rules you need to play Rivers of London, including character creation, character advancement, and advice for the game moderator. A solo adventure, the domestic, designed to introduce players to the world of the Rivers of London and the mechanics of the game. Details on policing in London and how criminal investigations are carried out. And the Bookshop, a standalone adventure that further introduces players to the game and magical world of Rivers of London. I believe uh, the Fae have a lot to do uh, with this setting. So Joseph says the graphic novels were pretty cool. Coco B said they read the first couple of novels. So Flaming Heron says, they're pretty sure if you like the stream at least five minutes in, actually does increase possible engagement. Okay. All right. So we've got playtesters. There are uh, quite a few authors here. Uh, strangely enough, it looks like the, the font is... A little bit smaller than I'm used to seeing in a Chaosium book. So the authors are Ben Aronovich, Graham Barber, Paul Fricker, Adam Gauntlet, Lloyd Guyon, Lynn Hardy, Gavin Inglis, Mike Mason, Karis McDonald, and Lucia Sanatowicki. I know I blew that name up at the end. Sorry, I'm sure I mispronounced plenty of those. Okay. So here it says, uh, ever since I can remember, I've wanted my own role-playing game. I lie. It's actually ever since I was given the three original beige Dungeons and Dragons books in a box all the way back in the late 70s. Either way, it's a long time. So that's from Ben Abramovich right there. Paul Fricker, a little intro. So an introduction to collaborative storytelling. So one gets the impression that this is probably uh, coming from a kind of uh, vantage point that most people checking this out aren't going to be familiar with the role-playing game. I will point out that artwork is awful. <laughs> Sorry, that just looks awful. Okay. I don't know about uh, any of you out there who are taking a peek here, but um, that, that, looks, that looks pretty bad. So Kabuki Kid says, little brown books or little beige books? I always call them little brown books. I think most people do too. All right, so we got an introduction here talking about what do you need to play? So I should mention that the fine folks over at Chaosium Inc. were kind enough to provide me with this review copy. But neither I nor anyone else affiliated with the gaming gang has received any other sort of compensation for me to share this coverage with you. And of course, D 
these days it's important for you to know that. Obviously enough, we are not going to look through each and every page of Rivers of London. But I want to get a good feel for what's in this. I know nothing about this system. I'm assuming it's BRP. But I, I'm also relatively clueless as far as the setting itself. And I don't know. This, this art design, I don't know. So it's not doing it for me. Now, this doesn't look as bad as the other one. The other piece of artwork looked like things were, like, cut and pasted onto it. So this is a solo adventure like you would find with Call of Cthulhu in order to get an idea of how the system works. All right, so this is a very uneven art design philosophy so far. So here we've got our creating characters. So it looks like we have little, little sidebars with uh, additional rules and game master advice, or I guess in this game they're calling it the game moderator. So we have investigator, occupations, architect, artist, athlete, author, chancer, member of the clergy, computer specialist, criminal, dilettante, doctor of medicine, driver, entertainer, farmer, firefighter, influencer, journalist, lawyer, lecturer, librarian, nurse, paramedic, parapsychologist, police officer or detective, private investigator, service member, social worker, special agent and tradesperson. Here, I thought they were all cops. <laughs> so you're gonna determine your occupation. You're gonna assign characteristics. You're gonna take advantages. You're gonna determine your skills, create a backstory and equip the character. So that is how you are going to go about assigning your characteristics. So our attributes are the same as usual, except for there's no charisma. So we've got our strength, con, dex, intelligence, and pow. So that's something we're used to seeing. There is no charisma in this system, which, yeah, that's fine. And it looks like uh, you're just simply assigning points. So just like the latest edition of Call of Cthulhu, your attributes are percentile as opposed to what you would normally <laughs> sit down. Uh, so Kevin says no education either. I will. I wasn't expecting education because I don't think education is normally used in basic role playing. I know it's certainly not in RuneQuest. So, uh, but charisma, I was a little surprised. So it's giving us a breakdown of what the numbers mean. It's like we also have luck. So now we have common skills and combat skills. And it looks like we have some very, very abstract skills. Are there, I would think there's more skills than this. I think maybe these are just saying that, saying that, okay, so these are just common skills that many characters will have. I don't know. We'll find out. We've got a backstory.
Well, I will tell you from what I am looking at here, this looks like this is a pretty... This is looking to be pretty kind of abstract. So here we've got like melee weapons, axe, brass knuckles, chainsaw, cricket or baseball bat, and our base weapon damage is one. Two for the chainsaw. Heavy handgun here, two. Crossbow, one. Bow, one. So we're not seeing... Oh, this is 1d6, this is 1d8, this is 1d10 for damage. So, so Kevin says, education said, I thought they used that in modern settings. Wouldn't expect it in a fantasy or medieval uh, setting. Well, we'll get to skills here. But it's, you know, what? It's, it is possible that those skills I was just looking at, Oh, here we go. Now we got a little more. So I was going to say, wow, that's that's not much by way of skills. Kabuki Kid says, yes, the Ministry of Silly Walks. Yeah, I noticed that. They, they had the, uh, the, I guess we would say the, the wage earner standing there. It did, it did almost look like John Cleese. So... Expert skills, we've got accounting, acting, animal handling, disguise, forgery, history, locksmith, occult, ride, sleight of hand, tech. Combat skills, fighting, and firearms. So those are our two combat skills. So we're going to get a breakdown of the various different skills and how you utilize them. So, Kevin says maybe they're trying to make combat less deadly or the characters use magic more than physical weapons. Well, seeing that it takes place in London for the most part, or at least England, I wouldn't expect there to be a lot of guns. <laughs> so, I just kind of get the feeling that uh, the game design is probably... Uh, a lot less crunchy than what we're used to seeing. So Flaming Heron says, possibly it's a more investigative setting like it really should be. I was kind of thinking that as well. The, maybe it's like, you know, combat as a last resort. But as far as the art so far, that we've seen, I mean, some pieces are fine and some are just, just look awful. <laughs> it's like, what? So we do have optional combat rules, it looks like. Because it's saying additional uh, combat rules are presented in the additional rules chapter. So yeah, <clears throat> you're not um, you're not rolling uh, like various different size dice for damage. It looks like it's just a just a point system. I don't know. I'll have to once again. I don't. I don't have a clue of the system outside of, you know, your traditional basic role-playing Call Cthulhu RuneQuest sort of presentation and approach. Flaming Heron is, says, nothing is popping out from the book that I'm going, oh, wow, that looks amazing. I will be the... First, to also agree with Flaming Heron. And that is now, keep in mind, I'm skipping pages here, obviously enough. But, I mean, the setting itself and the, 
the game might be great, but it it's not like here. Like we're seeing a lot of artwork where it's like okay. So it's an underground sign. It's like, wow, that's make oh man, I really want to play. Rivers of London, now that I saw sign for the underground. Working together for Stranger London. And uh the, the rest of the artwork just is you know, it's a, certainly not like RuneQuest or Call of Cthulhu, where you're like, oh, man, oh, check that out. That is really cool. So far, it's just all kind of bland. But, of course, I am going to read through all this and give it a review. So, you know, something like that, that's fine. Artwork like that, that's fine. Kind of showing, you know, day-to-day -day life sort of. Okay, so I'm swearing in these officers here. So it looks like this is the uh, the GM portion of the book. But yeah, so like an example here. Looking at that artwork. Well, that's that's not any anything exciting. Very uh very soft details and stuff. I, don't know, I guess this was, it was just a, a design decision to go with, you know, more of a muted look. I would think maybe, yeah, so Flaming here, can I say it looks like a children's storybook? I was just about to say, maybe the decision with the the art style was based on the sort of players they, they're expecting to pick this up. So it looks like we've got a breakdown of the folly. But like, you know, once again, okay, so here's a couple of people sitting at a table and a servant is serving them. <laughs> okay. I mean, a lot of this feels like placeholder art. I don't know. I don't know. Okay, so here's our adventure. So I'll kind of skip through. More of that. Tell you, there's a good amount of page space devoted to the adventure, at least. I mean, this this might be fine. This might be, you know, this might actually be really good. All I'm saying is, uh, visually, it's it's not getting any creative juices flowing for me. But then again, I was thinking that Rivers of London is is more of a, you know, like, I don't want to say grim, but I thought it was more a little, little darker sort of urban fantasy. I mean, yeah, like I said, I could be absolutely wrong. So we've got some ready-to-play investigators. So then it turns out that I guess the folly isn't, I thought it was part of the municipal police department. So John Brunhaver is with us. Art can be expensive. I get that. I completely understand that. Uh, we are talking about chaosium though. So we've got some appendices, our investigator character sheets. 
like an NPC sheet, contacts. Here are our authors. All right. Well, I will say that this is, uh, this certainly does not look like anything I was expecting. Really doesn't. Once again, I'm not going to imply that it's not any good. All I'm saying is I'm, I'm just surprised by the art. All right. Well, there you have it. There is Rivers of London, the role-playing game from our friends over at Chaosium Inc. 400 page hardcover with PDF carries an MSRP of $59.99. Or you can grab just the PDF alone right now at Drive Through RPG for $29.99. So, Joseph Qualms says lost sales from bad art can be expensive too. Excellent point. So Flaming Heron says, I'm worried people will be turned off by the look, even if it was a great book. I'm with it. So Kevin says, I see at least three different styles of art. It's hard to get any consistent tone from that. I agree. Uh, we have some pieces of art that looked as if they may have just been photographs. Or they were just photographs that were digitized so they look more like artwork then had some that almost had a a pastels sort of look to it almost like a watercolor look to it then we had some that looked like almost like cut and paste photos it was weird just very very strange so kathy says it is interesting yeah, we'll see what happens so Coco P says, well, it's a book. So cool. Like I said, you know, we'll, we'll see. This might be a, a cool system. I don't know. I just, I'm just used to seeing, for the most part, really excellent artwork in Chaosium releases. That's kind of one of their things, that their graphic presentation is also very uh, eye-popping normally. Not so much this. All righty then. What's cooking the rest of the week? Well, tomorrow, <coughs> excuse me, we are going to take a look at the latest, speaking of Call Cthulhu, Nameless Horrors, Six Adventures for Call Cthulhu. We'll be diving on into this tomorrow. So I am looking forward to that. And then on Wednesday, the horror continues as we dive on into Delta Green, the conspiracy. And also as a bonus, we'll take a look at Convergence, which I do believe was the first Delta Green adventure ever published. So we will be taking a peek at both of these from our friends over at Arc Dream Publishing. Next week, we might do a week devoted to The Witcher. Because if you have been following the shows, I shared with you uh, that our Telsorian game sent a bunch of uh, releases for The Witcher as well as Cyberpunk Red. But the core rulebook wasn't in stock at that moment. So what I am thinking of doing is maybe taking a look at a trio of the Witcher releases doing Artel Sorian Games Week. So we'll see. I'll decide by Wednesday what we're going to be taking a look at next week. So if you like the video, by all means, please give it a quick thumbs up. Subscribe to the Gaming Gangs channel if you haven't already. And if you do subscribe, ding that bell. It'll not only let you know when the Dispatch streams live, 
Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday evenings right here on YouTube at 7 p.m. Central. I'll also inform you when I upload other original videos as well, such as my recent Paizo preview for March 2023, which I posted last Wednesday. Everybody enjoy the rest of your morning, afternoon, evening, whatever time of day it happens to be in your neck of the woods. If you were watching live, thank you very much. If you took part in chat, a bigger tip of the cap to you. But of course, I know a lot of you out there, you don't have an opportunity to watch live. It doesn't matter if you're watching live or on Memorex. Thank you very much for taking time out to watch any of the videos here on the Gaming Gang channel. All right, everybody. I will be back tomorrow. And of course, here's hoping each and every one of you gets to enjoy plenty of great gaming with your gang. Oh, hey, you're still here. Well, that's okay, you don't have to leave just yet. In fact, why don't you subscribe to the Gaming Gang channel right here, or take a peek at the latest live stream, or even find out what YouTube recommends you check out from the channel. And of course, I'm Jeff McAleer. Thanks again for watching.